This podcast contains discussions of child abuse, sexual repression and sexual abuse, suicide, racism, misogyny, PTSD and PTSD symptoms, and spiritual oppression and abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, we will be mentioning some of these concepts in a general way without any graphic detail. If any of these topics or other triggering topics will be mentioned in great detail, we will let you know at the beginning of each individual episode, as well as in the show notes for that episode. Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast, this homework edition of the Leaving Eden podcast, and not just any homework edition of the Leaving Eden podcast, this reverse homework podcast episode, Leaving Eden podcast episode. That's right. I am here. My name is Gabrielle Hakon, and I am here with my excellent co-host. Hi, I'm Sadie Carpenter. I'm recording on my brand new system, so I'm very excited about that. I have my glass of wine because we are talking about a super romantic IFB topic today. Of course, this is IFB romance, so no wine is allowed (laughs) for them. Okay, I have wine because I have to talk about Jack Scop and I need it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and you deserve it. You're a wine mom now. Let's be real. You know what? I accept the mantle of wine motherhood. I'm ready to do this. Okay, we are ready to do this uh, because this is not just... What are we talking about today, Sadie? What did you assign me? <laughs> you, uh, The audience may have heard of this book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, which is by Josh Harris, um, who, by the way, is my dream podcast guest of all podcast guests. He is maybe my number one dream guest for this show. So oh, wow. Okay. In with Josh Harris, let him know that we need him on the show ASAP. But this uh, this guy, Josh Harris, wrote a Christian dating manual and in the, I believe, the 1990s. And a lot of people who were what we might call fundy light, like not all the way IFB, but pretty fundamentalist, might have had that book. Well, the book we're talking about today is not I Kiss Dating Goodbye because I Kiss Dating Goodbye was just not strict enough for people in the IFB. Really? Really. I mean, I'm pretty sure I Kiss Dating Goodbye advocated premarital hand-holding, which is just not going to fly. No. <laughs> so a uh, a person we've mentioned on this show before, a young Jack Scop, took it into his own hands to write the IFB dating manual, which is called Dating with a Purpose, otherwise known as Dating with a Porpoise. And uh, we are going to be discussing and reviewing that today. That is right, because this podcast is the podcast about Sadie Carpenter's life in and escape from the independent fundamental Baptist cult. Uh, We talk about this cult. We talk about other cults. uh, We seek to educate and to inform the public about the dangers of this cult and other cults and to promote freedom of mind, freedom of thought, and freedom of religion. But in this book, uh, there is not a lot of freedom that is allowed. No, just sadly. a lot of very specific rules. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So I want to talk to you about this. So this book is called Dating with a Purpose. It is written by Dr. Jack Scott. I guess doctor. <laughs> what does he have a doctorate in? Oh, we're going to explain honorary doctorates now. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. They so just you know give, about honorary yeah. doctorates, right? Yeah, that's where you're you're a famous person, you're a celebrity, and then a university will ask you to be their graduation speaker and give you an honorary doctorate. Okay, yes. But like IFB schools do this and you don't necessarily have to be noteworthy in any way. You just have to be like friends with the pastor. And then they will go very, very all out to put doctor in front of their name from like for like in perpetuity forever. Um, so wow, okay. Dr. Jack Scott, so Hiles Anderson does not have a doctoral program at all, period, in any subject or course. So, so he hasn't written a dissertation. No, 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 no. 
So any doctorate from Hiles Anderson is an honorary doctorate. And that's something that I feel like people know about honorary doctorates, especially from Bible colleges. But I think a lot of people are not aware that that HAC does not have a doctoral program. So any doctorate from there is automatically honorary. So this guy's just uh, he's just uh, some Joe Schmo walking around with doctor in front of his name because he likes being called that. Um, but so it says dating yes. with a purpose on the cover. It says common sense dating principles for couples, parents and the youth workers. And I want to talk about the cover to this book real quick. Oh, so I'm, I'm so glad. I was about to ask you about that. I was about to ask you to please describe the cover to us. Uh, I, I feel like this cover, the cover to this book is what like romance would like, like stereotypical romance looks like in like 1987. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's got yes. like satin. It, basically the cover of the book is like a satin sheet. But it's with, kind of made where there's plausible deniability that it's not actually a sheet because sheets are too sensual. Yeah, sheets, like, especially if you've got satin. I mean, I had satin sheets on my bed once. They were purple. And I knew exactly why I bought those sheets. <laughs> <laughs> because purple's your favorite color. Yeah, and, you know, and because I love prints, you know, that's, it's, right. uh, that's, that's 100% of the reason why I did that. So it's got this, this, like, box of chocolates. Uh, there's roses on top of the box of chocolates. There is, uh, a, I guess, a jewelry box also on the sheet. and Or tablecloth. It could be a tablecloth. It could be. I mean, it's a very wrinkly tablecloth. Yeah, but, but there has to be. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and then there is an open ring box with a diamond ring in it. Or it could be a cubic zirconia. I don't know. They probably it's probably a cubic zirconia because this is the IFB and they can't afford diamonds. See, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that's Cindy Scop's engagement ring. That's her actual ring? I think I have heard someplace that they did use her ring for the photo shoot. But that wow. could just totally be off. Like that could be totally wrong. So I, I take it so we look at the cover to this book. The cover to this book is like so this is what you want. You see this cover and you're like, oh, that could be that's what's in my future. That's what's in store for me if I follow all of the rules that are in this book. Yes. Ultimate romance is in store for me. Ultimate if I romance. Get married the the IFB ways. Yeah, but I think that we we brought up some of the stuff that's in this book and i think the third or the fourth episode it was the episode whichever one that had mountain moo in the title because we talked about ifb dating but we never actually and we we brought up a lot of the things that were in this book but we didn't actually like go and like review the book itself so i want i want to ask you like what was this book when you like for you when you were young did you like read this book all day every day just like <laughs> How did you know? Uh, so yeah, I I encountered this book, if I'm remembering correctly. So my church had a book table in the back of the church, and they would order books from different publishers, like sort of the Lord Publications and also from Hiles Publications, which is what originally published Dating with a Purpose, and from other Christian public, IFB Christian publication companies. And then they would have all these books for sale on so they would order the church would order these books and pay for them. And then you would pay somebody at the church to like reimburse them for the cost of the book. If you bought a book off the book table, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's like the scholastic book fair, but way worse. <laughs> no uh, Captain but, Underpants. So I remember back there was the Hiles Church Manual. I know Trail of Blood was back there, which is now familiar to our audience. Oh, I'm trying to think what else was back there. Lots of books by Jack Hiles, Jack Scott. Uh, how to Bear Infants, How to Rear Children by Hiles. That sort of, this is the sort of reading material that they were encouraging. So they're just hawking their own wares. The way that I remember encountering dating with a purpose was that it was on the book table at the back of the church. And being a bookish young person who had read my way all the way through the school library by the time I was about 11, I would hang out by the book table in the back of the church. That is how I recall first encountering dating with a purpose. So how old were you? How old were you when you first picked this book up? Oh, I would have been I would have been like maybe pre-teens or maybe early teens, like you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 kind of range. But are, are you familiar with all of the terms in this book at that point or do you not know what they're talking about? I would have had a pretty good idea because I've already been so I guess I might have been 12 because 12 is the year that I went to youth conference for the first time, which would mean that is probably the first time I heard Jack Scott preach was what it would have been 12. That was the year that I joined the youth group and my church 
really, really, really discourage teenage dating. In fact, I don't know of anybody who actually did date in their before college who was a member of our church. The only teenagers that I knew that actually dated were like bus kids or people who like one parent went to our church and the other parent didn't. So they weren't super sold out to the whole IFB thing. Like I didn't know any actual IFB kids from my church who actually dated in, in high school. But nevertheless, of course, I was pretty interested in the idea of dating. Of course you were. Who isn't when you're 11, 12, 13, 14 years old? Yeah. And I, I, so I was reading this book as this. So I always, I always grew up with the idea that I can date as soon as I go to college. And I was having this vision of <laughs> turning 18, getting through the summer after high school graduation, and then immediately stepping onto Hiles Anderson College campus into the wide, wide world of dating. And get yourself, uh, cuff yourself a boy immediately? Uh, sort of, yeah. I just, I was like so excited about all of this. This is so this is something that's finally going to be available to you. So you are reading and reading so and rereading reading this book. It. Yeah, and I'm reading it as like I've got to store away this information in my mind because Jack Scoff is like a major expert on dating and relationships <laughs> and because yeah, you know, I'm going to go to Hiles Anderson and that's where I'm going to meet my future husband. Like I need to like absorb all of this information so I am super prepared for dating the Hiles Anderson way, the right way. So I'll get all the dates of Hiles Anderson and I'll meet God's perfect will for my life. And everything is going to be silk sheets and boxes of chocolate and roses and engagement rings. And then you will get married and uh, have some uh, beautiful Christian fundamentalist children and your life will be perfect and idyllic. I have a beautiful non-Christian fundamentalist child. My life is pretty great. Yeah. Well, hey. The rest of that didn't exactly go (laughs) to plan. Sadly, no. Um, so we're going to so so you are very familiar with this book. Like you could probably quote pieces out of it at me if you yeah, wanted. And I chose not to like completely reread it for this homework episode. Uh I skimmed so I bought my copy on Amazon uh within the last year sometime. I found it for like two bucks on Amazon, so I felt okay about buying it because I knew it wasn't giving money to, you know, Jack Scops. Uh, jail commissary fund. Yeah, if, if for the people that maybe don't remember this, this book is written by Jack Scop, who is at this time in prison for being a pedophile. Uh, for actual, well, technically, he's in prison for sex, sex trafficking. trafficking of te- a minor. Technically, what he's in prison for because yeah, because preying on an underage person was not enough for this man. Um, but go back and listen to First Family of Fundamentalism episodes uh, four and five if you need to know. The full backstory of who this is. Yeah, this guy's not a great guy. Uh, he's, uh, but like the, his rep, he had this reputation in the IFB is is what you've told me of, of being a relationships expert of just like yeah, which m- went very off the rails eventually. <sighs> um, yeah, clearly. But, so I bought my copy of this book on Amazon, so I didn't contribute to his jail commissary fund, and I skimmed it, but I haven't read it in depth, cover to cover. Because I thought it might be fun if you can kind of surprise me with some stuff that I may not remember was in there. Because I'm sure I'll remember it as soon as you say it. Okay, so we're going to – what I want to do, I, I wrote some notes about this book. I read this oh, book cover to cover, all of the words of it, um, and went all the way through it. <laughs> what was um, worse, reading this book or drinking Mountain Moo? Uh, reading this book. <laughs> This book was really not very good. I mean, it was funny. <laughs> the, the The funny thing about this book, I've got the main thing. The main thing about this book, forty percent of the stuff that's in this book is not insane. But the other sixty percent makes up for it. Yeah, the other sixty percent makes up for it. So there's a couple of places where I'm reading this, and I'm just like, you know, this guy's got a point here. <laughs> well, I hope you share with us some of those things that you think that that Jack Scott made a good point about. Yeah, so I, I want to go because we talked about this. We talked about uh, a little bit. You mentioned it that teenage dating is highly discouraged, and I wanted to say why because right in the preface of this book they tell you why. So on page what like eleven of this book they say you shouldn't date if you are a teenager, not because he's like uh it's going to encourage impure behavior or because of uh, because you're not emotionally ready or some nonsense like that. He's going, he says, it's because 
it's going to distract you from soul winning for your church. Wow. Okay. So that I that I that is one of the things I did forget. Yeah. So look, it says uh, right here. He says, "I am not an advocate of teenage dating, and by that I refer to junior junior high and high school dating. The benefits are negligible, and the complications are many." Too much life is wasted on temporary romances that rob teenagers of quality time with their families, learning practical trades and skills, studying diligently, or being involved in Christian activities such as soul winning. You know what takes away time from soul winning? Literally anything. When when your pastor who's in his 50s preys on you, takes you on trips across straight state lines and betrays your trust and ruins your life. That's what distracts from soul winning. Sorry, I'm going to be salty this whole episode. You know what? That's totally fair. This guy's a pedophile. So there are a lot of people in my life who have done things to me that I don't like and don't appreciate. There are a lot of people that I know of that have done things to other people that I don't like and don't appreciate. There are very, very few people that I truly despise. There, I, Honestly, there's there's maybe four or five of them. And that's it. A lot of people, for, like, I've just been able to kind of let stuff go. So you really yeah. fucking hate this guy. Jack Scoff and Steven Anderson are two of the people I absolutely fucking despise with every fiber of my being. And as uh, we can add uh, Jack Scoff's brother-in-law, David, to that list as well. Oh, yeah. Dave Hiles, too. <laughs> Hundo P. I, I want to get back to the actual material of this book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, I could I could hate on Jack Scop all day. I could just abuse him on the radio all day. I think that would be hilarious. Uh, some Maybe one day we'll have like a Jack Scop hate fest episode, Ooh, which I think would be really funny. inner. Where it's just like a roast of Jack Scop. But then we, instead of <laughs> saying like funny, mean things about him, we just say things that are true about him. <laughs> That that like, actually that sounds super fun. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah, we could uh, as as like a telethon. <laughs> oh my gosh, leaving yeah. even telethon. That's a great idea. So I wanted to go here because also in this preface, there's some very interesting things because he's like talking about he's like the practice of dating is not found much in the Bible. I suppose you could say that Jacob, quote unquote, dated Rachel even though he ended up marrying her sister. <laughs> <laughs> or you well, could say that her too. Jesus, sorry. Yeah, he he married two sisters, which is, I mean, it, it's it's a, a story. It happened. Yeah, uh, or you could suggest that Boaz, quote unquote, dated Ruth. It is interesting. Note that Boaz was seventy years older than Ruth. She was forty. He was one hundred and ten. Dating is more of a Western culture practice. So he's like. <clears throat> Boaz and Ruth did not date. But Ruth, mm -mm, look up what feet really mean. Boaz and Ruth did not date. I don't know what you're talking about. Actually, I, I, I don't know the the specifics of whatever verse it is. I'll tell you another time. Go ahead. I'm trying to restrain myself. I'm trying so hard. In the introduction to the book, though, because this is the preface. He has a preface and an introduction, which I think is a bit. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. That's maybe I feel like. I mean, his doctorate's fake. That's a little above your station, don't you think, buddy? Uh, a, <laughs> a, a preface and an introduction. You can have a preface and then you go from the preface into chapter one. Or you can have an introduction and then go from the introduction into chapter one. You can't have a preface and then an introduction and then chapter one. I'm sorry, buddy. I don't know who you think you are. I don't know. What he has to say is really important. He needs to introduce it twice. Yeah, because in the introduction, the introduction, he tells the story of how he met his uh, wife, who he then cheated on by Ugh. transporting a 16-year-old girl across state lines for the purposes of sex and went to prison for it. Uh, but he talks about how amazing his romance was with his wife, about how he's like, I was 18 years old. The thing that's wild to me, this is like an absolutely insane story. So he, the, the, the narrative of the story is I was 18 years old and I went to church and there, the pastor there was Jack Hiles. And he said that he had a 16 year old daughter. And immediately I was interested. Like he doesn't know anything about this girl except for that. She exists and she is 16 years old. And her dad is this pastor. And he's immediately just like, mm, let me get it. Yeah. That makes sense though, because it, it is unspoken in the IFB. It is unspoken so much that people almost kind of forget that this from phenomenon exists. They don't arrange marriages, usually. 
most people. As a rule, <laughs> IFBs do not arrange marriages. But okay, so okay, look, here's how I'm going to explain it. You know, I've talked about like the social classes at Hiles Anderson before. Yes, how like if you went to Hammond Baptist, you're like at the top, and like if your dad is like a really successful preacher, then you're also at the top. And if your dad isn't a successful preacher, then you're like not at the top. And, right. and if, you if you're like, a bus kid, then they uh -huh. think that you're like scum of the earth. Right. And if you're not like sold out to the college, if everybody knows that you're just kind of going through the motions, that's that's another thing. It kind of gets you put on the bad side of this. Okay, if you're so there for your one and done, then they hate you and they don't want you to date anybody and they might uh, expel right. your date for continuing to date you. Yes, that that's a story that a listener told us in our Facebook group. In the IFB, you're, you're very much expected to make like a a prestigious match. It's not like they, they don't arrange marriages, but... This is like Mulan. Yeah. Okay. Here, I'll tell you a story. I think I can tell this story and get away with it without giving away who this is. Yeah, I can do it. Okay. So when I was about... I was about 15 years old. I may have been young 16, but I really think I was 15. A friend of my dad's who was working in ministry elsewhere came to our church, said in front of the church... Like looked dead at me and said, oh, by the way, I have a son who is also 15. He's this old. And these are his hobbies and interests. And this is what part of the ministry he wants to be in when he grows up. Like very pointedly, like used my name, stood in front of me to say this thing in front of my entire church. Like wait, in public? Yes. <laughs> yeah. In, so in, in church service, in his sermon. To, and like pointed at you and like said your name. That's wild. He's like, hey, you know who else is 16 and loves Jesus? My son. Uh, that's weird. And then, so my family took this guy out to eat after the church service, which is what you do when visitor, like preachers visit. And um, he just literally kept on it the entire time that he was there for for his visit at our church. That's inappropriate. He literally never let up of like, you should date my son. Okay, so this isn't the same thing as like me going to some Jewish thing. And then some old lady is like, how old are you? What do you do for work? I have a daughter or I have a granddaughter. She went to Brown. Um, she majored in psychology and now she's getting her master's. Well, it's not and like that. Like, it's, it's not like that. She's scientific. like, I would love to give you her phone number. She's very pretty. <laughs> like, no, because he wasn't like that guy did not care about making a love match or about my supposed compatibility. Like what that guy wanted, my dad, like my dad's church was bigger at that time. And what he wanted was to secure a pretty girl from a good church for his son. Wow. Hmm. It had That's absolutely wild. nothing to do with me and everything to do with like what I could potentially do socially and ministry wise for his kid. So it's like, uh, I mean, it isn't Pretty like gross. an arranged marriage, but it's like uh, Fiddler on the Roof when Tevye was going to. Weirdly enough, I did know his son at Hiles Anderson. The son's actually really cool, did not date him, was not interested, but he's a good guy. Hmm. So for what it's worth. So so sorry, but that's why Scop is trying to get with Cindy, because it's a prestige match thing. Okay. Yeah. And I guess that makes sense, because if Hiles is like, I have a 16-year-old daughter in his sermon, then that means that he's like putting her out on the market and and you also have to know the the context of the backstory that cindy hiles was jack hiles youngest child and a lot of people say that they they were that he was the closest to her out of all of his children um she also wrote his biography they had a, they had a, a very close relationship compared to him with the rest of his children so she's kind of, she was kind of his prize well, Cindy actually shows up later in this book, not just from Jack's story, but she writes one of the chapters in this book, which is interesting. But so like in this story, so Jack is like, I am immediately interested in this woman. And then he, for whatever reason, transfers from whatever college he's going to in, in Michigan to Hiles Anderson College. And the first day he gets there, some somebody's like, I believe that you should marry Cindy Hiles. And he's just like, okay. And then he goes to his, his dorm room and his roommate who apparently, I guess he just met that day is like, Hey dude, you know who you should date is Cindy Hiles. Like literally just met this dude this day. Th this is just the most bizarre and unbelievable story that I have ever seen. And then he's introduced to her 
they get married when she's like 19 or something. So he's introduced yeah. to her. And yeah, and Cindy um, graduated high school a year early, maybe a little bit more than that. She went to Hiles Anderson immediately after graduating high school. So she was at Hiles Anderson before she was 18. Scott proposed to her, I believe, when she was 18 and wanted to get married immediately. But Jack Hiles said, no, you need to give me an extra year. And then they waited a year and then they got married when she was 19. This is this is story. Like, so when you were reading this story. When you were a kid, were you just like, oh, that's the most perfect romance I've ever heard in my whole life? Yeah. If because only I could find a boy <laughs> who would, I would be chosen by God for him. Like, <laughs> Yeah, because like what could be a more perfect marriage than one that was set up by God? I guess. It, it, so, so here's what we were taught. If you marry the person that God has ordained for you, if it's God's will, then you will never have any kind of marital problems. Because, like, like you don't have to worry about if you're sexually compatible with somebody before you get married. Because if they're really God's will, then you will be, and and you'll just you'll just you'll just want all the same things, and and just your your whole life you'll you'll love the same style of house, and you know st- style of home decor won't ever bug each other, and you'll want all the same baby names, and everything will just be perfect because you picked God's perfect will for your life. But we all know it doesn't work that way. <laughs> out in the real world well not one of these a jerk at least but but like so so the the fantasy that scop is selling is that his marriage was somehow ordained by god and that he is for like that he's to be commended because he followed god's will huh okay okay so that's what because there's all it's like with sheffy where there's all this subtext that i just don't understand okay that makes sense but i want to skip ahead a little bit because in this book it says principles for beginning dating and you get like this list of like rules for dating rules for relationships and i'm trying to think if any of them really bother me and i mean these all just seem like really arbitrary like the man should ask a lady okay whatever they're conservative uh limit the number of dates to a maximum of three per two week period and dates should not be more than 45 to 60 minutes long see this is the thing though is that you guys like or i I keep saying you guys i'm sorry i shouldn't say you guys but like the (laughs) fun i don't think you're ever gonna fully quit doing that i mean they'll be like like what constitutes a date is like spending any time where it's just you and this other person talking like in public that's more than like what 10 15 minutes yeah if these fundy guys at like this college were like bragging about how many girls they went out with it's just like oh yeah i talked to eight girls yesterday at the coffee shop like had i had eight 10 minute conversations with some of that like no because very few people actually go by that like like the 10 minute rule like only like the really really sold out people would be going by that and the really really sold out people wouldn't be interested in how many people they dated hmm. because for the really really sold out people it's a point of pride to date as few people as possible before you get married really yeah, like the ideal is that you only ever date one person and then get married. That seems because, like a terrible be, idea. Because you give pieces of your heart away to everybody that you date. Oh, right. Especially Purity if culture. you, you know, do fornication, by which I mean kissing. Like then you give away pieces of your heart that you'll never get back. And then your heart isn't whole to give it to your eventual husband or wife. Then if your eventual husband or wife doesn't love you like as much as they should, it's because you gave pieces of your heart away to all those other people. So it's your fault. Mm. I should have put a TW before that. <laughs> I'm sorry. We'll, we'll put that in the show notes. Uh, <laughs> Why am I doing my church lady voice on the podcast like constantly? Well, you did this it last week. time. I know. I know. I know. I can't stop. So it says the man should plan the outline for of activity for each date. I'm yeah, going to come back to that later. Clear. Because later there is a list of acceptable date ideas <laughs> that are very interesting. I want to read a few of those out at some point. But it says the early stages of dating should be filled with action type dates rather than conversation type dates. Going bowling is an acceptable type date, but having dinner together is mm, maybe not so much. I don't know why. That, well, just... probably because there's a bowling alley on Hiles Anderson campus. Uh, does it cost there money? Was. You know, they tore it down by the time I got there. But if I remember other people talking about it, I feel like it was free or very, very, very cheap for students and then cost like an average amount of money for a bowling alley to non-students. Huh. Okay. But, you know, they had like Hiles Anderson tour tapes playing in the background <laughs> and no beer. 
Number seven, though, it says, remember that you cannot go backwards emotionally in a dating relationship. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say that that is not true. I guess that is true, though. Because, like, once you... Yeah, okay. So, yeah. So, you're, like, if you're dating somebody and you say I love you to them, you can't unsay I love you. No, but you can just, like, close yourself off emotionally and wait for them to break up with you. Yeah, but you don't... For over, like, a period of weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks because you don't want to do it yourself. Yeah, I don't think you do that in an IFB relationship. Because that was, like, that's probably, like, considered lying or something. Hmm. I mean, it is it is kind of a skeezy move and not very uh, uh, considerate, but it is a thing that you can do if you're not a very nice person. Rem- okay, so it says, but here's the thing, though. It says, remember that most people do not marry the first person that they date. Yeah, so That's it's presented as like, okay, so in courtship culture, which is the Duggars and the IBLP and other people that we're going to talk about later in the summer, in courtship culture, you do typically marry the first person that you court. If not, you marry the second person that you court if you have something fall through. In the IFB, it is, it is acceptable to date more than one person, but you are supposed to be very selective about it. There's not a lot of bragging about numbers like, oh, I've dated so many people. Like, I've dated 16 people would be a shameful confession, not a brag. Because, like, the ideal number of people to date before you find the right one is, like, two or three. Like, you really – like, it's totally fine to go on many first dates. Like, it's it's totally fine, like, if you – Go on a lot of first dates and like date different people. It is not okay. It's not seen as okay. It's not seen as desirable to like serial monogamy, like date somebody for a semester and then break up and date somebody else for a semester. Like you can't, that, that's social suicide at Hiles Anderson. Interesting. That's like you really don't want to date more than like two or three people or you're going to get branded as like a super slut. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of wild, but okay. Yeah, it's it's just backwards from how other people look at it. So I'm I'm still in here looking at this uh You're looking at it like the first time that he just gives like a list of rules. Yeah, he's just giving like a list of rules, uh, but one of them Don't worry, there's plenty more lists of rules. <laughs> so here's one of these things that, uh, number five though. I want to go on on page twenty nine. On page twenty nine of this book it says Men, remember that your girlfriend is someone's daughter, sister, or future wife. And then it, a little bit later, it says, A few years ago, I had to break up a major fight between three brothers and their sister's boyfriend. The brothers had driven several hundred miles to fight this guy because he had been getting physically involved with their sister. It was a very nasty situation, and the boyfriend almost lost his life. So they beat the shit out of a guy because what? He, like, made out with their sister? I mean, they just say physically involved. He just says physically involved. It, he doesn't say anything. But, like, if you're IFB, physically involved could be hand-holding. Could or, literally be, like, holy hands, yeah. I mean, but the thing is that there's a lot of stories in this book. There's a lot of times in this book where Jack Scott will just go on, like, an anecdote of, like, somebody had a conversation with him and said this thing to him. You think all those people were Paul Sand? Yes. I think that many of these conversations never actually occurred, and Jack Scott just kind of put them in his book. It's like a sermon illustration illustration as you would say except for it's uh, putting a, a fake sermon illustration in your book yeah see the thing is i think you would have so jack scott did work in the youth department at first baptist church of hammond for a while and then he also worked at hiles anderson for quite 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 a while before becoming vice president at hiles anderson i believe and then later becoming the pastor of the church so you'd have to know somebody like you'd have to know someone who was in his youth group in like the 70s and 80s you'd have to know somebody who was around when he first started working at Hiles Anderson. And then you'd also have to know somebody who was around towards his later years at Hiles Anderson. Like you'd have to, you'd have to span the full amount of time between him getting to the college and started working for the church and him writing this book and Mm. know somebody from all of those eras to try to figure out if any three boys ever beat up some girl's boyfriend. Yeah. I mean, it's just very difficult to, to 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 disprove uh any yeah. of these things i mean we tried to disprove one of these stories we did not actually disprove it but we also found very little evidence that any of it was actually true so he, number seven though it says if your date gets physical with you don't deceive yourself into thinking that they were not physical with someone before you and they will not be physical again with someone after you which is wild because he tells this story about like this this girl that they were counseling 
um and she, apparently she made out with this boy she and then she's like crying because she's like i'm not the only girl he kissed and hugged he lied to me and i feel emotionally raped which I'm is i'm sorry what yes these are the words that it says recently this girl came to me crying said and i quote you were right brother scop i'm not the only girl he kissed and hugged he lied to me and i feel emotionally raped which is an extreme statement i believe that she probably did not say this because i feel like if you're a woman you would probably not say that because you know no I, i don't see it that is very much a thing that a man would say if he had no idea how women's brains worked and was trying to just say something wild. That's uh, like 99% sure that that's fake. Yeah. Oh, that is, my. Oh. That's not great. Mm-mm. Yeah, this book I is. I feel like you. <laughs> just like... Yeah, this book is utterly insane. <laughs> there's this, uh, I mean, and there's another one of these stories in here where he's talking, Um, he, he's like, after I put, uh, finished speaking to Don and his friend, there's some guy in here named Don, and he comes up to Jack Scop and he says, "Brother Scop, much of what you said makes a lot of sense, and I'm, but I'm still going to hold hands and probably kiss my girlfriend." And then Jack Scop says to Don, "Why is that so, Don?" And then Don says, "Because it feels good, and I like <laughs> doing it, I guess." And then Jack Scop compares not kissing your girlfriend to uh, taking out the trash because he hates doing it. Right. And then he's like, if you really love her, then you won't like, then you'll take out the trash when she wants you to, because I guess Jack Scop hates taking out the trash when his wife asks him to. And then Jack Scop's like, well, if you really love your girlfriend, then you won't kiss it. Like, this is another just very stupid analogy that he hasn't. Like, half of the book is just him, like, going off on weird anecdotes and telling these stupid analogies. And I'm like, this is not analogous at all. I do not understand what you're trying to say here. So you're telling me that Jack Scott wrote a book about teenage sexuality and like his specific ideas on how teenage sexuality ought to be. Oh, we've covered this. I believe we've covered this in. Um, uh, Sorry, yeah. it just kind of hit me again, like with how controlling he's being and knowing that he wrote this book for teenagers. It just seems so obvious now. That like all these like scenarios that he's making up. Oh, I don't know because I like to hug and kiss my girlfriend. Oh. Like it, it's just very obvious where his head is. I love opinion. hugging and I love kissing. Okay, well, good for you. Well, okay, it's like it's boy. like in, it's like in in a walk hard and I'm Dewey Cox's twelve year old girlfriend. <laughs> it's like this is what's going through my head right oh, now. God, yeah. Mm. So chapter three uh, is all of it says defraud not one another and this one is all about purity i guess that's the juicy chapter this is the purity chapter and this one is where we get the goods because what i want to say is that i opened this so when you loaned this book to me like a year ago when we were first starting to do this podcast and you wanted me to do some research so you loaned this book to me and this is one of the things that really jumped out at me there is a diagram in this book that is hilarious so it's like a stair, like it's like a, a, a sideways staircase with like five or six. I'm going to put a picture of this on the Instagram, but it has like steps where like at the top is purity. And then after purity, there's a step down, which is a step to holding hands. And then there's a step down from holding hands, which is to hugging. And then a step down from <laughs> hugging is kissing. And then for a step down from kissing is is necking and petting which <laughs> i was so hoping that i remembered that right <laughs> necking and petting i didn't even know what that was i had to google it and look it up on urban dictionary because i guess this is something that they that like people would say in like an after school special in like 1987 no, that's what it sounds like but then after necking which one and pe- of us is going to explain to the listeners <laughs> do you want to i don't even remember it what it is base. it just means third base that's all it is it just sounds weird. And then after necking and petting is the final step. And like, <laughs> so at the top in purity, there's a, a heart, like just like a regular shaped heart. And then at the bottom, there's a heart that's like ripped in half. Like the diagram has it ripped in half. And underneath it, it says, 
ruined testimony. Ruined testimony. <laughs> yep. So what's really so I, I got to circle back to the necking and petting though because yes. So I've was, never heard it. I've never heard anyone say that except for like a like a, a, a really. Oh yeah, I've heard preachers preach about that literally all the time growing up. Did you know what they were talking no, about? No, I had literally, dude. I had no idea what they were talking about. Probably. Oh my gosh, I was well out of the cult and into like my mid twenties before I like either googled it or just put all the pieces together and like, figured oh, out what they've been talking about. That's what that about. was. Yeah. Oh my goodness it was so long before i like <laughs> figured out because this was a rule okay in my school rule book because you've seen the hiles anderson rule book but you haven't seen my high school rule book which i think i have one i'm really gonna try to find it for you but my my like elementary high school had a rule book that was very much along the same lines of the hiles anderson one and it had so we got demerits for certain offenses mouthing off to a teacher would be 25 demerits stealing anything would be 50 demerits okay makes um, sense yeah like not pushing in your chair would be five demerits like you, you know like a typical like kind of like a military school you know demerit system but i remember it being 50 demerits so like 25 demerits if you touched the opposite gender 50 demerits if you kissed and then 75 demerits for necking and petting and all my all my growing up life i was like what the heck is that you know what the only time i ever heard the word necking was when <laughs> okay so there's an episode of seinfeld where jerry is going out with some girl and they go to a movie and they're like making out in the movie but the movie ended up being schindler's list <gasps> right do you remember that yes i know this one and newman was also in the movie theater and he tells on jerry to his parents they're like you were necking during schindler's list which is admittedly very inappropriate yeah that's but a <laughs> that choice of movie <laughs> yeah but like that's the only time like i i'm like what is no that's just like literally panic? what it's called in the ifb like i didn't know it was wow. called anything else for quite a while Th but it's very ambiguous about what that like what that could mean but yeah, that also ruined means testimony they can give you like 75 demerits for whatever they want though ruined testimony is uh clearly fourth base so yes yeah exactly you score and you but, score ruined testimony. You score ruined testimony at the bottom of this these these steps, and I guess hell is there as well. Uh, but you need to get saved and forgiven. But the, then there's this all of these Bible verses that say thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, makes sense. And then it says flee fornication and whoremongers and adulterers. God will judge. And then it says. For this is the will of God that ye should abstain from fornication. I was just going to say I literally hate it when preachers use the word whoremonger to refer to somebody who's sexually promiscuous because it is literally right there in the word. A fishmonger sells fish. Like it is clear what that is. It's talking about pimps and specifically abusive bad pimps who are people who should go to hell, like people who abuse other people and use them. It is not talking about any kind of quote unquote sexual sin. Yeah. So people who get arrested for a uh, promotion of prostitution. People and... who get arrested for violating the man act. Yeah. Oh, you mean like Jack Scop? Like Jack Scop. Yeah. Like, I mean, I just, whoremongers, just... that's like human trafficking, right? That's exactly. Yeah. yeah. Whoremongers, it would be like, like human trafficking. I also take it to include like, yeah, like abusive pimps or people who abuse sex workers. But like it is clearly right there in the word in your King James Bible. That word has nothing to do with sex, like consensual sexual promiscuity. So I, that's just one of my major biblical pet peeves. Anyways, uh, then he goes into some long-winded story about driving on the highway or something. Um, mm. But what's interesting- The exit story, right? Yeah, the exit story. I've I, heard him tell that one in person. Like a lot of this book, um, just, I'm going to be real with y'all. I read a lot of it. I totally just did not care about a lot of it because it wasn't interesting. This story was very uninteresting um, and it was long winded and it didn't make a lot of sense. And it was just like a long walk for a short drink of water. So I don't really want to get into it unless you really want to talk about it. No, no, no. That's fine. You go, you go on and with your book review. I'm just here to. <laughs> I'm just here to cuss out Jack Scott when I get a, when I get the the option. No, this book is utterly terrible. <laughs> no, it, but like somewhere it says, 
uh, number four, it says, don't begin reading books that address the physical aspect of marriage more than three, three months, months before, before your wedding, wedding. date. Mm -hmm. So Remember, I this, told is, you about that. this is something that we are going to talk about because in the future of this show, there is a Baptist sex manual. What is that one called? It's called. Oh, are we going to are we going to spill the title? Or is somebody else not going to scoop us? I don't know, but at some point, some we we have a Baptist sex manual that we have as like a PDF that is like the the sex like how to because I mean you know they they literally a lot of these people you know they go to their they literally don't know how sex works before they don't have any sexual education like we talked about in the Stephen Anderson episode and this is like a a, a pamphlet I guess that they have to read so that they know like literally the mechanics of it. Is, yeah, am I, mean, I getting it's that a book. right? It's a, it's a whole book, but like it's like it's pretty. It's a pretty thick book. It's in the like three hundred pages range. At some point in the future, we're going to talk about that. We're but going yeah, to actually is, review that. So there that. are several uh, Baptist sex manuals that get passed around or that get that get given to people. Um, someone I knew who shall not be named. Uh, her father-in-law gave her husband a copy. <laughs> Well, maybe maybe a couple weeks to a month before their wedding date, and then and then her soon to be husband passed it on to her so she could read it. Um, Interesting, but they didn't have the. Did they have the conversation together? No. Oh, that's no. scary. No, you're not supposed to actually talk about sex with the person that you're about to marry. If you feel like you absolutely have to do it, you're supposed to wait till like a week before the wedding. Yeah, but you, you but you're allowed to read uh, one of the approved fundy sex manuals at three months before the wedding. They're kept in a special locked area of the Hiles Anderson Library. So ninety one days yeah. before the wedding, can't read it. Nope. Ninety days before the wedding, bam! You're allowed to know all the dirty deets. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and you can uh, just like Kenneth, you can. I'm a real good sex person. And I know how to do it all the ways. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you for bringing it. Kenneth is like, I think I love Kenneth because he reminds me of every like sincere Hiles Anderson boy ever. Yeah. And he, that's that's Kenneth. him after reading uh, the Baptist sex manual. Okay. Where, so so where were we? Oh, you were talking about more rules. Like don't don't read books dealing with <clears throat> the physical aspect of marriage. Yeah, they can't say sex. Of... That's too perverse. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So here's point seven, though, because this is one of the things where I'm like, okay, it's forty percent of the stuff in this book like makes absolute perfect sense, and then like sixty percent of it is batshit insane. Point seven. It says, let your limits be known to your date, not harshly and unkindly, but firmly and sincerely. If your date's limits differ from yours, you should both decide to abide by the stricter of the two. Or you should decide not to date. I'm like, you know what, Jack Scop? It's weird that you have this whole thing about like consenting and setting limits for people when you are currently in prison for sex trafficking of a minor. But this point here in this book, I'm like, that makes sense. You know, set limits. If you're not down for something, tell them to begin with. And right, like if there's if there's something. That's on point. And it's not just physical stuff. Like if there's something emotionally that is just it is upsetting for you or is triggering you, you're just not ready for in a relationship. It's a great idea to tell somebody that you're going out on a date with like, hey, we've been on three dates. This is my deal right now. I'm just like, I'm not ready to move in with somebody. And if you want to be in a relationship with me, you shouldn't expect to move in together any sooner than like two years from now. Like not just physical bound boundaries, but emotional boundaries. That's a great idea. Well, that makes sense. Put one in the W column for the pedophile. Well, I mean, here, this, that's the point. <laughs> um, so chapter four is principles of dress. This is basically just telling you what you are and aren't allowed to wear on a date. Um, and it's is got... this the one where he talks about colored hose? Or is that later? Yeah, but it says like, so God does not want you to dress in a stuffy out of date style. He would want you to look dowdy, uncomfortable, or strange. He does not want you to look like that. I am convinced that Christian young ladies look as sharp and classy as they can afford to do so. It boggles my mind how we justify our sin. If a woman were to walk through her neighborhood wearing only her undergarments, she could, and should, be arrested for indecent exposure. However, 
if she paints those undergarments with bright, flashy colors, puts sand under her feet, and stands by a hole in the ground filled with water, she is totally justified in her immodesty. Please explain to me what makes that right. Does the presence of sand, the location of water, the degree of temperature, or the geographical location make it acceptable? No! Right and wrong are consistent the world over by all people who choose to follow the principles of God's word. No, it's just (laughs) appropriate for a woman to wear, or anyone, woman, man, or non-binary person to wear whatever makes them comfortable in any given situation and you know what makes them feel comfortable in the social situation in which they find themselves unless you show up underdressed to a very uh highfalutin social function that is a sin Um, unless you wear a camo dress to a satyr yeah if you wear a camo dress to a satyr uh that's between you and your god but but seriously like (laughs) what gets me about this is the idea that a person's body can be offensive like yeah like not like anything that that person is doing because people can certainly do offensive things with their bodies yes they can but like the idea that just like a woman's body existing is should have her sent to jail in his mind yeah like that's a little crazy to me that's wild to me he's just like Uh, then it's he says blah 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 men women clothes should not pertaineth to one another or something. I don't know. Yeah, Doesn't... yeah, yeah. He gets into the De- Deuteronomy twenty two five thing. We all know about that. If we don't, we'll do an episode on it. We'll probably talk about that during uh, 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 LGBTQ Pride Month. Oh yeah, that would be a good place to put that. Actually, so chapter five. Chapter five is interesting to me because he starts this thing, th- this chapter out where he's telling a story. And this chapter is low-key actually kind of on point. At least this first part of the chapter is on point. One more thing that's like low-key on point for this guy. Um, he says, Robert was frustrated. He had been looking for the girl of his dreams for several years without success, and he finally sought counsel. When I asked Robert what he was looking for in a girl, he pulled out a well-worn eight and a half by 11 a piece of paper, which he referred to as his dream list. There were over 25 items on his list of necessary qualifications for a wife, including items such as play the piano, sing solos, make her own clothes, not more than 120 pounds, confident and meek and quiet. Oh man, I was I, I was like almost good with that. I like I was like almost checking off all those qualifications. I could have married that guy except for the weight limit and the the meek and quiet bit. Robert doesn't like thick crust on his pizza. Also, Robert has, I guarantee you, if you put like five people in a lineup in front of Robert and said, which one is like, which one is 120 pounds? He would have no freaking idea. Men have no idea how much women weigh. That is the truth. Also, like you could weigh 120 pounds and be like five, two, or you can right. be like, if you're like five, seven, then Weighing 120 pounds looks a lot different than weighing 120 pounds if you're five foot one. Like, right. Like, I'm like that- <laughs> the biggest fan of a lot of fitness influencers because I feel like they can be a little disingenuous with how they get the results. Oh, they're absolutely but, but the one worst. One person that I really trust, um, who's a fitness influencer, has posted pictures of herself at 130 pounds uh, when she was not in shape at all and pictures of herself looking much smaller. At like I think her her competition weight is like one forty six. Oh, what is she body a uh, bodybuilder? Like super major bodybuilder. Damn. And she was also like honest about her. She just had a baby. She was honest about like her weight gain during her pregnancy and all that kind of stuff. And sorry, people don't have any weight limits by a number are absolutely the stupidest thing in the world. No, it's ridiculous because a lot of people have different body composition. Like, I, how much do you think I weigh? You. Yeah. I don't I haven't yeah. seen you. Um, I saw you two days wait, ago. You're, when you're the six book. one, right? Six foot one. You're six one. You weigh 165 then. I weigh 178 pounds. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. Cool. You Okay. So you have a lot yes, of muscle you, mass then. Nobody knows how much anybody weighs. See, I, I don't know how much I weigh because I like myself better when I literally don't put a number on myself. You literally just had a baby. Why would you go and weigh yourself? Oh, dude, I haven't known how I have not known how much I weighed in over 10 years because I found out this. This one's a free this one's a free pro tip for our listeners that has nothing to do with IFB dating. If you are triggered by and upset by 
the idea of weighing over a certain number of pounds like I was for many years, maybe because of bullshit like is in this book. This man who like, wants a woman who weighs 120 pounds or less, which is kind of a ridiculous. That's, that's very a, small. Like, that's unless, a small person. Unless you're under five foot, that is very small. There was a certain number that I was hung up on for literal years that I just could not stand myself if I weighed one pound over it. And I would like very much obsess over it. It was, it was not healthy for me. Yikes. And you know what I did? I uh, One part of, of my healing process from that was I quit weighing myself. I go to the doctor when they put me on the scale. I will very dramatically cover my eyes and I will say to the nurse, I don't like to know how much I weigh. Thanks. And nurse, I'm sure, will understand every and say. that gets respected every single time. My doctor's office prints your weight on your, on your, um, they give you like a little summary at the end of your visit and they print your weight on it. I will have a nurse just cross it out so I can't see it. Um, it goes on your chart. You don't have to know what it is. I don't check my chart. Like if I need to see it, I cover, literally cover it with my hand. I know this sounds a bit intense. It is worth it. It is a thousand times worth it and the effect that this has on my mental health. So there's your free pro tip. If you were damaged by this kind of material or other kinds of material, you don't have to know your weight. Just go by how you feel. And anyway, the number like the number doesn't really have anything to do with any it's literally just It doesn't. Like how if I can walk up a hill has a hell of a lot more to do with how healthy I am. Absolutely. Yeah, That's, if I can I, like hold a plank for the amount of time that I like to be able to. Like if I can touch my toes. All of those things are way more valuable to me than a number. Absolutely, 100%. Anyway, I'm going to get back to the story. So I'm this Sorry, I haven't I haven't drank while recording the podcast in a while. No, you know what though? This that was a very good thing to say because I feel like a lot of our listeners they need to hear that or they want like that is I don't want to say they need to hear that because that sounds like mean or whatever, but you know what? We need to these customize, are things that we need to talk about. Customize your health care to take care of your mental health. That's what right. the point is. Yeah. So anyway, this guy Robert He's frustrated because he can't find a girl. Robert. Yeah, this guy, Robert, uh, he seems very picky. Uh, so Jack Scott says, I looked at Robert and then back at his list and I said, Robert, you left off an impair a very important item off this list. What's that? Robert asked me. And Jack Scott says, you forgot to put down here on your dream girl list that she better not have a dream list of her own, because if she does, you're in trouble. <laughs> Basically, Jack Scop looks at this guy, Robert, and says, yeah, you want this guy like you think like you think you're hot. Shit. You can't pull a girl this hot. You need to lower your standards. You think you deserve a woman who conforms to your 25 point list. Yeah, which seem very arbitrary. So play the piano and sing solos. That seems like a bit much. Like if you have somebody and she's and you want somebody, oh, she's really good at piano. You know, she could be really good at piano and she might not also be the person who sings solos. That's, you know, really discounting to people who are really good at piano. Oh, yeah. Like right? I'm, I'm really good at piano and I can sing, sing back up, but I don't sing solos. See, it's not it's it's not right. I feel like he would just be like pass you know, and totally well, he, just he would, like that's that's the point that Scott is making is that this guy has like ridiculous standards. That's the thing is that you can't like make a list of things that you want for somebody for, for your future partner, because then you're just going to discount all of the people who, you know, maybe they don't meet all of those, but maybe they meet like some of them, you know, you yeah. like, you're just going to throw out a bunch of people for really arbitrary reasons. And then you're going to end up alone. And, and Scott does make an actually decent point here because I'm, I'm if I remember rightly, the, the point that he ends up making is like make your dream list of like things that you really need in a partner, but make it like four things long. I mean, that makes sense because I want to move on, though, because the, he has this list of like, so what should your dream list be? Um, these are the criteria that you should look at for dating somebody. Uh, number one on here it seems like a bit odd to me that Jack Scop is saying this because it says as a general rule, you should not date someone who is more than 25% older or younger than you. For instance, a 15 year old should not date someone older than 18 an 18 year old should not date someone older than 22 and so forth. Or a 17 year old should not be, um, doing anything with how old was Jack Scott? 49? 56. 
56 at the time? Or is that I how old he is now? So, no, anyway, he's older than that now. He's in his 60s now. He was in his 50s. I know uh, a 17 year old girl should not be doing anything with this grimy ass old man uh jack scop who wrote this like this is literally he wrote this in his book and then he did the opposite so yeah this guy sucks bye and he's in jail for it um we're just going to keep reminding everybody that jack scop is in jail for sex trafficking of a minor for two um, more years for two more years sadly when he not out, uh, when he gets out we're 10. gonna have a protest party yeah when he gets out we're going to uh I guess, well, he's going to have to register as a sex offender, won't he? Yeah, but y'all let me know. Like, when he gets out of jail, y'all let me know if you want to go stand. Like, I know what jail he's in. I know what day he gets out. I have access to this stuff. Let me know if you want to go stand outside the jail with signs to, like, welcome him back into the world. Yeah, we could. Let me know. Yeah, the other thing that we could do, uh, because he's going to have to register as a sex offender. So Mm -hmm. we'll be able to find out his address on the internet really easy. Yep. Um. And then, so that'll be fun. Yeah. It just so happens, like I know what jail he's in, uh, un- unless they move him, and I don't think they will. It's a great centrally located jail, an hour away <laughs> from an international airport. So y'all can all come party with me. It's true. Flights are really cheap right now. Yeah. You can go there and go back for like two hundred and thirty dollars. Yeah. Like he's in Kentucky. He's like yeah. an hour from the Louisville airport. We can do this. That's great. Yeah, uh, so I want to move on because point two, it says the person you date must meet your parents' approval. Okay, yeah, sure, whatever. That makes sense to if you're a fundy. Honorable reputation. Um, so here's the thing, though. It says, number four, I recommend you date somebody you could enjoy seeing every day for the rest of your life. There should be chemistry in a relationship that is heading towards marriage. On point from the pedophile. I'm so, like, these, this book is just like kind of ridiculous to me. I'm well, sorry. I mean, who needs that many rules? Yeah, uh, fundies. You fundies is who needs that many rules. And you're like, what, halfway through the book? I am. I am like halfway, like having to remember all of these things. And then there's one where it says how to ask out a girl, which is interesting. And it kind of goes like etiquette guide for a minute, right? Yeah. Like stuff like if you're asking somebody on a date, you should tell them where you're going to be going. Oh, I want to. And what type of event it is, which is generally like that's a nice thing to do. I want to go back real quick though, because I found something on page fifty-two that I thought was super fucked up. Oh, okay. So page fifty-two, he tells another one of these crazy stories. Tells the story because it's about like, oh, you should only date a born again Christian, and he tells the story. Julie was a beautiful. Uh, and was beautiful and had a vibrant Christian testimony. She loved her parents and her church, but Julie fell in love with an unsaved boy and no amount of counsel or friendly advice could say, could sway her from making plans to marry this guy. Uh, Julie repeatedly said he'll get saved soon after we're married. He promises to attend my church. And so goes the path of deceit and brokenheartedness, blah, 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 blah. Night before the wedding, Julie's fiance is a stag party with his unsaved buddies. He was still drunk at the wedding and his best man had to physically hold him up while he slurred through his vows. Julie assured everyone that this would all change after the honeymoon. It didn't. It never does. Then it jumps from there to three years of marriage, two children, and dozens of physical beatings later. Julie cries, I would rather die than live another day with this marriage. I'd rather my children die than suffer through this hell on earth. Why didn't I listen to these warnings? What the f***? Oh, right, right, right. Because if you marry somebody who's not saved... And they'll like beat you up or something okay, so like this that's is what, remember the conversation we were having with uh with somebody a listener today we were both on the, like the podcast account having a conversation with somebody yes this is like this is what he was saying like it's either you do things god's way and everything is perfect or if you don't everything's gonna go to shit like, so literally your entire life is gonna suck forever did you ever watch arrested development i did so you know how there would be that guy, Jay Walter Weatherman, who was missing an arm? Yes. And so whenever... Oh, uh, right. Oh, right. Whenever George Bluth would want to teach his kids a lesson, what he would do <laughs> is he would invite Jay Walter Weatherman along with them or something. And then there would be some... They would do something wrong and there would be some mishap and his arm would get sliced off. He was already missing an arm. So but he's like the arm would come arm. off. Yeah. yeah and he's that's wearing, why you always leave a note. Yeah. And that's why you don't shoplift or something like that. Like, 
just like our, and like his arm would, that's what this is reminding me of it's just ridiculous okay that's that is entirely accurate that is that very is, accurate it's like if you do this thing wrong like deus ex machina will happen and like it will destroy you <laughs> yeah and that's how that's how you see it it's and, so bizarre yeah and and i would i do want to say like this leads to a lot of ocd like thinking among people who get out of the ifb because it's like, oh, if I don't do this thing this certain way, God is going to make me get in a car wreck or God is going to burn my house down. God is going to send a tornado to kill everybody that I love or God is whatever. Like if I don't do it this right way, then terrible things are going to happen. And that can turn into fully turn into OCD or that can turn into some serious OCD anxiety. Type. Yeah. Or, or just major, major anxiety disorders. And that's this is one key reason that that's so prevalent amongst people who have left this kind of church i want to move on to how to ask out a girl <laughs> okay how, <laughs> so jack how do, has how do we how do we ask out girls how do we do okay that? so he tells a story about how he was super nervous he asked out cindy and she went out with him or something i guess um because I don't we're care. supposed we're still supposed to be saying this is like the greatest love story of all time yeah he's like i mean it it, it doesn't have shit on titanic let's be real but so there's several steps in this process. It says, one, have a mutual friend introduce you to the girl before you ask her for a date. So he's like, have you met Jack Scott? Like, <laughs> yeah. Step two, a few days after you have been introduced, let her catch you looking at her, which. <gasps> oh, I remember this. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So is this that is the like... best? So I, I feel like you have a story about this. <laughs> No, it's just this is literally how you flirt in the IFB is you so you can't get you caught just stare at, at somebody. Yes, but not if you're a woman. If you're a woman, you can't get caught staring at the man first. You've got to catch him staring at you first. Then you've got to wait a couple of days and then you can catch you can let him catch you staring at him. OK, but th th <laughs> like in the real world, I mean, in the real world, you know, oh, oh my gosh, <laughs> say say I'm at a bar and I see a pretty girl there and I'm just like, oh, maybe I want to talk to her. And what you do you look at her for a bit. If she looks up, makes eye contact with you. You look down. You look back up. She still makes eye contact with you. Go over and talk to her, right? I mean, that's right. how it works. And that's how it works in the real world, right? Right. But like here, it's just like, oh, this is how you flirt. You, you let her catch you looking at her. And then you look away and don't talk to her. But right. you've already been you like, introduced at this point. And then you like let some time go by. Yeah, and then so it says, but step three, between the time you were introduced and you ask her for a date, try to cross her path and greet her personally with by name and with a pleasant smile, which, okay. Step four, when it comes time to ask her for a date, speak to her when you know she will not be in a hurry and she won't be with several of her friends. Um, I mean, that makes sense. Because you don't want to always ask somebody out like when they're with other people. That seems kind of like that could be embarrassing. You know? Right. And you also don't want to ask, try to like stop somebody to ask them out when they're literally running to work or something. Yeah. This is also kind of Hiles Anderson centric though. Hiles Anderson is a small campus. Like may, it maybe has the footprint of a, of a large grocery store. It's small. So it's easy to like run into somebody on purpose at the college. I like mean, I've done when that. You're going to run into somebody. You know, when I'm in college, like you, you know, okay, she always, uh, she always stops by. Uh, I guess she has like a class at eleven thirty or something, and she always stops to get coffee before then. So if you're trying to talk to a girl, you make sure that you're in line for coffee at eleven thirty. Like that's not that weird. That's like normal stuff that you would do when right. you're in college. It's just, yeah, it's just a lot easier because of the layout of Hiles Anderson. I'll show you a map sometime because you totally care that much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So step five is use her name, remind her of your name, briefly state, briefly state the question. I, I feel like I'm reading a sales pitch. Um, step six, ask her a few days in advance of the date that you are planning. Step seven, don't expect an immediate answer, but rather ask her to give you an answer the following day at the same place and at the same time, which seemed odd to me because that seems like, I mean. Book was written pre-cell phones. Oh, okay. No, that makes perfect sense. Because you can't just be like, because that's all that I'm used to is I'm just being like, oh, hey, um, I got an extra ticket to this show. Would you like to go with me? 
you know, do you want to, what are you doing later? Do you want to go to the show with me? And she'll be like, Oh, let me check my schedule. Uh, can I get back to you? Be like, yeah, sure. What's your phone number? Like, but right. that doesn't you work. You and I are, okay. are not old enough to have ever dated in the world without cell phones. Cause this came out in like 1994. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. We were literally toddlers when this book came out. <laughs> yeah. So it says if her answer is yes, give her the details of the place, time chaperones and proper attire. I always get confused when I see chaperones. If her answer is no, Ask her if there is a possibility for a later date. Yeah, when a girl says that she's busy, there's like a 90% chance that she isn't busy and that she just doesn't want to go out with you. That's a fact. Uh, and 10, remember when you approach a girl for a date, she is just as nervous, if not more so than you are. That is actually true. I think you have found everything that is even remotely okay in this book. See, that's the thing is that like half of the stuff in this, like not half, like 40% of the stuff in this book is like, okay, that makes sense. And then there's a weird, he'll like say some, like f four sentences that make sense. And then one sentence will just be like, take some weird religious Christian turn and not make any sense whatsoever. Ugh. Well, it makes me wonder if there's a potential that he plagiarized parts of this from like an etiquette manual. Oh, I would not be surprised if he plagiarized parts of this from anywhere because that's how the IFB does is that they plagiarize stuff all the time. Chapter seven is catching his eye. This one wasn't that interesting to me. It just said how to. That's uh, the one they, they tell you how to dress and it's very, very 80s. And they also tell you not to be they tell you to be fashionable, but not too trendy. Their example of something that is too trendy is colored hose, like colored stockings which apparently was a thing in like the 80s yeah i literally don't know but apparently like instead of wearing like skin toned stockings you would wear like burgundy or green or blue or whatever like not like tights not like black tights that are cute transparent stockings but funny colors i don't know this is a really foreign concept to me yeah. But apparently this was like a really big trend in the 80s. Some what Scott says about this is that some guy that he knew almost didn't marry his wife and almost missed God's plan for him because his wife was so trendy that she wore colored stockings. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it's in the book. I I literally that's all I know. <laughs> this is the same chapter where they're telling you to wear shoulder pads though. So Yeah, well it also tells you to wear shoulder <laughs> pads and like large uh, belts and poof your hair up. So this is just another example of the IFB being stuck in this fantasy world where the 1950s and the 1980s occurred at the same time. Um, so chapter eight is called height, breadth and depth of love, which Ugh. is, Ugh. yeah. So this is where he talks about the relationship stages. Uh, there is the first date stage. There is the, I like you stage. There's the, I love you stage. There's the engagement stage and there is the, wedding day stage so we've talked about these before yeah we lived and died by the stages so like did you like have like a chart where like people you knew like what stage are they at no people would tell you like okay so if you so if you have you have friends who are like dating ages if one of your friends like post a picture on facebook and they refer to somebody as their boyfriend or girlfriend for the first time you might notice and be like, oh, so-and-so's got a new boyfriend. Good for her. Yeah. Okay. If somebody who you knew proposed to their partner and you saw that come across your news feed, you would be like, oh, my God, so-and-so and so-and-so -so got engaged. Great for them. Oh, my gosh. So happy for them. Right? Yes. Okay. It's like that, but with every one of these stages. So, like, what's the first stage? Is the first date stage. First day. Okay. And the second stage is, is the second stage boyfriend and girlfriend or I like you? No, the second stage is I like you. Is that before boyfriend and girlfriend? That boyfriend and girlfriend isn't a stage. Oh, oh, I oh like right. You. That's the same thing. Okay. So at Hiles Anderson, people have to ask you to be their boyfriend or girlfriend. It's a formalized thing and it is a very big deal. People will do like almost like a proposal for it. And you also have to go, you go on Facebook and you're like, so-and-so asked me to be his girlfriend. I'm a girlfriend. Like people do with like, I'm a fiance. It's the same, same thing. So it's, I mean, it's like the, when you have the define the relationship conversation, except for that there's only one option. But you have it over and over and over. You, well, there's, there's only like one option and then you do it over and over. And then, so after your boyfriend and girlfriend, you can't say I love you yet. But you get to say, I like you. So people will sit around and like stare into each other's eyes and go like, oh. I like you. Well, I like you too. Oh. Well, I like you. Well, I like you too. And it's very nasty. It's really gross. 
I, tell me that you didn't engage in this kind of disgusting conduct. I'm sorry, lying's a sin. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, had so had so done awful. it, had done it. Yep. Yikes! How many <laughs> times did you go back and forth? Oh God, I don't even know. That sounds incredibly boring. <laughs> but I guess you can't. F- so no, no, that's about that's about it. The yeah, Anderson. They're just pent up, ready to bust. So, <laughs> so you do that, like you do. I like you. And so you said, like the I love you and let's get married, like often occur at the same time. So or very so that's close the together. Other thing, like somebody will tell you. So the the man has to say he loves you for the first time. Like for, the man has to go first. He has to go for. Oh man! So the man has to go first on all of these steps. That actually sounds great because then you can't have girls asking you to define the relationship after like four dates. Right. So, which is uh, good. So, you just have, if you're, but yeah, but if you're a girl, you just have to sit around and wait. So, there are girls who like, who've been dating a guy forever and he is not ready to say that he loves them yet. So, they just like sit around and wait. And they're like 20 something saying, I like you to this bozo who, for whatever reason, won't say he loves them. A lot of guys at Hiles Anderson, there's been a trend not to say I love you until you propose. Like I know several couples who did who did that. They just never said I love you until whenever they proposed. So you get two at once. So you get two at once. So you basically you're ostensibly skipping stage three and going straight to stage four, going straight from two to four. No, you're just combining stages. Okay, so there's like four stages. So there's five stages in here, but you can do it in the four stage method yes. as well. And then you get married, like, but your engagement is not long because, and and they're very clear in here that you can't, like, that you have to make sure that you don't have sex before you're married. You got to wait, like, even if you're engaged. And it says, enjoy the journey, not just the destination. Yeah. So they also, they also suggest very short engagements for that reason. Which, I mean, makes sense if you're not trying to have sex before you're married, which a lot of people do that for many reasons, which... Is totally you know cool I with support, them. I, yeah, I totally support people who decide of their own free will that that's something that they like to do. I just don't support some pedophile telling you to do it. To do it, and I don't support people feeling pressured into not having sex before marriage because of a religious belief that that isn't their personal belief. I am one hundred percent with you, man. Nobody is willing. Nobody is allowed to tell you what you can and can't do with your body. Yeah, do what's like good for your yourself and your own body. But chapter nine, chapter nine is the chapter that I was really interested in because chapter nine is creative ideas for dating. Oh boy. Yeah. So chapter, there is how many dating ideas here? Uh, Jack Scott has a list of 74 different ideas for dates that he could do. And one of them, so number one, plan a picnic. Uh, Some of these are very nice, you know, plan a picnic, go canoeing go hunting i'm not sure how you're supposed to go hunting if she can't wear pants that seems like that's a bad Camo idea skirts. you take you take this is a skill that i acquired in the cult you can take a pair of pants that fits you in the waist and then you can there's a there's a method where you unpick the you and unpick you, the inseams and then sew it together into a skirt there's a way to do i could show you it's easier to show you than tell you but there's a way that you do it i used to do it with jeans That still seems like that would be very cumbersome um, if you were going hunting. Well, you don't actually hunt. You just watch the boys hunt. So you go out. You go out on the trip. Fiance is going to make you do something absolutely nasty, like put blood on your face, or like so, like all the hazing rituals that men do to men when men hunt together. Then your fiance gets to do that to you and laugh at you for being grossed out about it. Yeah, no one died, but it says stuff like learn the sport of archery. Or here's another one. It says. Entertain with a formal dinner at home. Ask a family member or a friend to dress up as a butler or maid in formal serving attire. Set a formal dinner table with white linen tablecloths and napkins, crystal, china, and candles. And here's the here's the best part. For food, you can serve anything from a five-course meal featuring... Chateaubriand to Big Macs. See, I think that's a cute date idea. I think like fine china and being super dressed up and eating McDonald's off of fine china. I think that's an adorable date idea. If I'm getting dressed up, McDonald's special sauce is not coming near 
what I am wear. Like those don't go together for me. I mean, you I'm wear, a fancy but bitch. You wear That's white. I, oh, like, all the time. In general, I don't own a single white thing. I mean, it's not that McDonald's special sauce is like even you know particularly messy because it's like pinkish beige. No, but like the the thing that bothers is like asking the family member or friend who dress up as the butler or maid. That well, they're doing double duty because they're also your chaperone. Oh, like that's duh. what that. Yeah, because th- there already has to be somebody there to chaperone you. So here's a question: Is it really difficult to like get? dates because you're like okay well uh, she agreed to go out with me but we can't arrange the chaperone is so that like what, a logistical problem that you constantly yes, run into but yes but no so Hiles anderson campus is effectively one large so it's either a chaperoned zone or a non-chaperoned zone so certain rooms hallways and outside areas on Hiles Anderson campus are assumed to be permanently chaperoned because there are closed circuit television cameras. There are staff members that are paid overtime to walk through the halls and watch people. And like, it's considered like permanently chaperoned as long as it's not before lights out. So you can go to one of these places and you know that somebody's going to be there like as right. like a so backup plan. So you can plan. go to like, so say at Liberty Square, which is the the little campus cafe on at Hiles Anderson. Um, so you can go to Liberty Square and like it's considered a permanently chaperoned area because there are always pe- multiple people in there. There are closed circuit cameras and there are staff members who walk through there all the time. Closed circuit cameras is like where I guess it is a there place of business, I guess. Cameras literally everywhere on Hiles Anderson campus. Just if anybody from from HAC is listening to this podcast, just like um just know there's cameras where you don't think there are. Have fun with that. That's really creepy. I can tell you where a couple dead spots are, though. So um, if you can prove you're a current Hiles Anderson student, I will show you where some dead spots in the cameras are. Oh, that's fun. Oh, yeah. Um, you're welcome. So those, so so if you want to date on campus, you're fine. You can take somebody to the Hiles Anderson dining hall for a date. And feed them slop. And feed them, yeah, uh, mystery meat. And it's fine because there's always somebody in there. If you want to go off campus for a date, that's when you have to have a chaperone. And that's where it gets really hairy because you've got to get a – so chaperones are only approved staff members. You've got to get one of them to agree to go on your date with you. They want to bring their spouse. You've got – you being the man have got to pay for all four people's food and any activities that you're going to do. So if you want to go off campus to – I think one of Scott's ideas is mini golf. If you want to go off campus to go mini golfing – You've got to you, pay for mini golf. You've got to pay for ice cream. You've got to pay for pizza afterwards. For four people. For four people. That's expensive. That's yes. a lot of money. Yes. Yikes. So people just don't really date off campus unless they're going to like go get engaged or something. I never had an off-campus date. For number 22, though, I want to move on to another date idea that Jack Scoff has, which seems to me a little bit like he's a little bit obvious about this one. It says number 22 wash your pastor's car together (laughs) as a date idea i mean doesn't that sound like a little bit too sexy well you can't wear like a real bathing suit you have to wear like a a, a, you have to wear a denim skirt and a polo shirt that sounds really uncomfortable to like get your denim skirt and polo shirt i've washed a lot of cars in a denim skirt it Mm. is just as uncomfortable as it sounds it's like going to the beach wearing jeans and then the ocean gets your pants wet and then oh that's just i have also swum in the ocean wearing a denim skirt i've got pictures that sounds deeply unpleasant funny to me that you haven't seen the pictures (laughs) number 25 though it says make a cracker jack surprise it says carefully open the bottom of a box of cracker jack find the prize package in the bottom open the envelope and carefully order you know reuse it Replace the prize package and reseal the box. Give the box to your date. When I first read this, it was like, open the bottom of the Cracker Jack box. I thought he was going somewhere very different with this. I thought he was trying the movie theater popcorn trick. Oh, oh no. Oh dear. I didn't know where you were going with that. Now I do. Now I wish I didn't. I'm sorry. This book is is starting this, to drive me to insanity. This book is utterly insane. This is the most ridiculous I'm, book that I've ever read. But the I'm last starting to lose it. Like, what else do we have to cover from this? Number book? 74 is uh is pray together, and this one has a long thing. I'm just like, I don't care. I don't want to read about how you think that praying together is a good date idea. If if Sadie, if you were at Hiles Anderson student and some and some dude who maybe you were kind of into was like. 
would you like to go out with me? Uh, and you're like, sure, what are we going to do? And he says, we're going to pray together. Would you be interested or nah? Not for a first date, no. 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 That's like a, what is that, like fourth, fifth date material? I don't even know. I'm trying to think if that, if the, if I had ever done that, but I, it doesn't ring a bell. I know I've prayed with dates before. Like, I don't know, one of us had a test and we like stopped to pray about it or whatever. Oh, that's really nice. But that's like, that's not that weird. Like, I know I've prayed with people that I was dating, but I don't think ever had a date where the date was praying. I want to move on to chapter 10 because this is this episode is utterly ridiculous because chapter 10 is all about like timing, right? It's all about like the person that you need to be when you're when, when you're trying to date somebody, which makes sense because you should make feel like you're more of a complete person before you offer yourself to somebody else, right? That's that's common right. sense. Like you should have a handle on who you are. Yeah. So it says serious dating should not begin before the young man has properly settled on what God's general direction is for his life. Right. Because if you're called to be a pastor and your wife, you're like the girl you want to date is called to be a missionary. That's not going to work out. So you should know that first. But here's one of the issues that I found out also from this book. It says page. Uh, is it page 88 here? It says if the first date does not go well, have another one. Oh, yeah. That's very common, like, Hiles Anderson logic. So if that date does not go well, give it one more try. If that date is not a great improvement on the first two, don't date that person anymore. But see, that's see that's interesting to me because, like, what a first date is basically just trying to figure out, is this person, like, not terrible like remotely pleasant to be around that's the thing at hiles anderson especially women so if somebody asks you out you are really not supposed to say no unless you have a very serious objection to going out with that person so if a man asks you out you're supposed to say yes and if the first date doesn't go well you're supposed to go on another date and if that date doesn't go well you're supposed to give him one more chance so you get three dates before you can really reject somebody yeah so if a guy tries to ask you out that's a huge commitment that like saying you really try to get guys you don't like to not ask you out to begin with, because if they do, you're stuck with the biggest hassle. So you literally like if a guy asks and then you can't date somebody else while you're dating right. that other guy. So like basically that's like two weeks of your time. Go like say you've got like oh, a good three Lord, no for three dates. That's like six weeks of your time. What? Because, dude, it's Hiles Anderson. Everybody's busy as fuck all the time. So you've got like a, a plan where you're like, where you, there's one guy that you've like really got your eye on, right? And you think he's about to ask you out, but some like Joe Schmo comes at you first and then you're just like, it, but you can't just be like, no, I think I'm into this other guy and I think he's about to ask. Like, you can't say that, right? You can, but like it's socially frowned on. And so then you've got like, then you're set back six months with the dude that you actually want to be with going out with some dude that you don't actually want to go out with because that's just like 45 minutes or to an hour of your time every two weeks that that's, that's utterly ridiculous. I'm sorry. That is, that is utterly insane. But, and then all of the status of all of this stuff is like kept almost like in a ledger from all the people. So they all know who's going out with who. And so if you like, so if you like say to a guy, I don't want to go out with you again after one date, that's like a big deal too. It depends on who your dating counselor is. I don't know what a dating counselor is. What is a dating counselor? So as a student at Hiles Anderson, you designate a staff member to be your dating counselor. And that staff member is kind of in charge of who you date and how you date them. And it's typically one of the people who are, you know, well known for being good dating counselors. So good dating counselors get their students married primarily. Good dating counselors don't have a bunch of students running around who don't have dates for shit. Some dating counselors are like, oh, yeah, date whoever you want. You went on one date and it doesn't work. Don't worry about it. And then other dating counselors are like, no, you have to go out with every guy who tells who asks you out and you have to give him at least two chances. You're not so, getting any younger. But you can't <laughs> like not listen to your counselor. Yikes. That's really bad because that's like. Not so somebody else is making all of these decisions for you as to who you can and can't go out with. That's wild. Right. So if you pick like I know somebody who picked a certain dating counselor and uh, just really pressured her to go out with the same guy, even when she didn't really want to. 
Wow. So it, it kind of, yeah, does that make sense? It like depends on who you, yeah, who but your I, counselor is. I don't understand why somebody would want to go out with somebody who didn't want to go out with them. Because if somebody doesn't want to go out with you, then that should be like a deal breaker, right? Why would you want to go out with somebody that like, I guess, but this is- a, Because a, you're a man and you want to go out with them. And because like what you want is what's important. Yeah, but I couldn't ever be into somebody who wasn't into me. She'll become into you. Like God will make her into you. That's fucking weird. You just got to anyway. get get it through her dumb head because she's a woman and she's stupid. I mean, it's amazing. It's it's ama- it's amazing that I have like a brain and a spirit. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> it really is it's something fantastic. <laughs> so we've got a few more chapters that we've got to get through because that that's just utterly insane right there. Chapter 14 is What Not to Look For in a Guy written by Cindy Hyleskop. I read this chapter. I thought that she was going to dish the dirt, but then I remember that like she was writing a book with her husband and it's very sanitized. And it's all just like, don't date someone who does not walk closely with the Lord. Don't date someone who is a womanizer for someone. So here's the interesting thing. She says, don't date someone for whom you have sympathy. The mother instinct is a girl who often causes her to feel attracted to a guy because of sympathy. Sympathy may feel like romantic love, but is not a good foundation for marriage. As a general rule, if you feel sorry for a guy, stay away from him, especially if you feel sorry for him because of his spiritual condition. In such cases, it is best for the girl to realize he chose to be where he is spiritually and she had better let a less vulnerable person minister to his needs. That's what? just a whole mess of weird. That is very wild. I mean, you shouldn't go out with people based on pity, but that's that is bonkers right there. That is some nutty stuff. Uh, those are that is a set of words that I never thought that I would see put together in one page. Uh <laughs> See, yeah, but I've seen that used against girls too, because like I there like if there is a dude who you feel sorry for him, maybe because other people pick on him, but you think he's really a great guy and other people are being unfair to him. Or if there's a guy who drives a really old beater car and you feel sorry for him for that. Or whatever, you know, whatever there's a there's a guy who's a you know great at one subject in school and terrible in another subject and you feel sorry for him about that like if if you exclude any guy that you feel sorry for in any way then that excludes some great guys and i've i've seen that used to break people up who didn't need to be broken up i've seen that used against women to control them is what i'm saying wow that is wild because this book is taken like gospel and that's the bottom line for me oy vey because see oh well cindy scott said don't date a guy for who you feel sorry you said you feel sorry for him so now you need to break up anything bad ever happens to this dude then you need to immediately break up with him that's right, nuts you feel sorry for him but speaking of breaking up that's what chapter 15 is about and you have to a first confirm your decision with your parents and your spiritual advisors uh so i guess your your dating counselor plan an appropriate time and place to break the news to your date prepare see, your word polite. That is polite. Take them to, I mean, you want to take them to a, a, a nice dinner, but not like nice, nice that they think that you're going to ask them to marry them. It says, prepare your words carefully. Speak kindly, slowly, gently, yet seriously. Start by thanking them for the great times you've enjoyed and the happy memories you've made together. Do Number six is do not blame the breakup on God. See, that's legitimate advice. Like, No, but that would be a great excuse if I was trying to dump somebody, people do that at Hiles Anderson literally all the time. It's I'm sorry, but God just told me it's not his will for us to get married. So I need to break up with you. That's a great line. It's the it's not you. It's me of Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> it is really like the most common breakup line, which is why I made it into this book. Do not blame the breakup on God. That's the it's not you. It's me of Hiles Anderson. Yeah. Um. God told me I've been praying about it and God told me. That you are not his will for my life. And because of that, I'm sorry I have to break up with you. Wow. So you can just say that without any... You can literally just say, God told me to break up with you. Yep. Wow. That's a... I mean, that is a great line, though. That's... See, that's one thing I'm not guilty of. Thank goodness. (laughs) You've never used that. See, there's nothing in here... I've never told someone that God told me to break up with them, no. Because I guess everything is all like... 
set up you know it's it's very methodical so you can't ghost out on people either right now i'm trying to remember if somebody did use that line on me because i i think i think richard may have used a variation of that line huh but i'm not going to accuse him that of that because i'm not 100 percent sure and you know what a lot of times i feel like that even might be honest where people will say that and they might be being honest about it I don't have a problem with 90% of this breakup advice. Okay. Well, there's a lot of lists in this book. There's the whole, it's play, a lot of lists. People. All it this really book is, is, is f-ing lists. All this is, is just lists of stuff to do and stuff not to do. And somehow it was still mo- the most uh, like amazingly interesting thing I ever read in high school. It's like a f-ing Buzzfeed listicle, uh, <laughs> like made into a book, but about Christian dating. It's the worst I ever read. This is not very good there's uh, a i think there's a wedding checklist the wedding checklist i wanted to get to later okay oh, okay because i used that to plan my to like plan my fantasy wedding when i was a kid you, so you oh, used yeah. this checklist this is chapter 20 the wedding checklist to plan your dream wedding yes i so this wedding checklist i loved like because what what it's like it's like 12 months before the wedding you need to do this stuff Six months before the wedding, you need to get engaged. You need to buy a wedding dress. You need to set a wedding venue. You need to set a wedding date. Like three months before the wedding, you need to pick bridesmaids and groomsmen outfits. And you need to start picking your wedding music. And you need to buy your wedding rings. And you need to book your honeymoon plane tickets. Like stuff like that. Okay. So this is all just like regular wedding advice. And it's probably just like lifted from, yeah, it's probably just lifted from like some etiquette manual or some wedding planning book. Also, though, I feel like these days, these numbers are way off because like, oh, my if, God, if you're trying to get married, you need to have a wedding venue set like in st- like you need to know like, where you're going to get married a lot more in advance. Yeah. Than- Venues are like a year to two years. Yeah. Now, I mean, or unless they- you do what I didn't get gorilla married on the on the waterfront. <laughs> yeah. But if it's like COVID, you know, everybody's had to postpone their oh, actual God. weddings or they just eloped. That's what everyone did. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just eloped. It was, it was pre-COVID, but I just didn't want to deal with it, and it was perfect. No, there was a bunch of weddings that I was going to go to that I was invited to, and that then COVID happened. They had to cancel them, and then all the people just eloped, which was really annoying because I like going to weddings. One of Jonathan's and my really close friends um, got eloped during COVID. We were on the video call, but still. But it says, you know, it's things just like. I hope they have a party when they're done when COVID's over. One day before your wedding, pack your luggage, leave your honeymoon itinerary with your parents or someone like this is all just like basic ass logistical stuff. I don't know why it's in this dating book. You could like I don't know either. I feel like at this point you should just like go to a wedding planner because there's people that you can pay to plan your wedding for you and they'll know how to do all this stuff. Right. And Uh, you know who who else knows how to plan a wedding? No, literally every Hiles Anderson girl ever. Because it's like the point of your existence. So here's here's a question. Do you ever run into people where you're like talking? To, so I'm sure you talk about your dream weddings. That's a, a topic of conversation. Yeah, with, like what are your wedding women. colors going to be? Do you have a wedding dress picked out? Do you have wedding music picked out? What are the names of your first four kids? Is that there kind of a thing, thing that's... conversation. Is there like a thing though that you're just like... You find out that like oh, this one... She's got the same exact taste. that She's going to have the same fucking wedding as me. Um, like... There are very few modest wedding dresses that conform to like IFB modesty. There are companies that make them. Um, usually they're Mormon owned companies. Sometimes also Muslim owned companies will make modest wedding dresses. The companies that make modest wedding dresses, there tend to not be as many styles available as wedding dresses that wouldn't conform to like the standards of modesty. And I'm sure they're also expensive too. Uh, no more so than regular wedding dresses, I don't think. Really? Well, no. wedding dresses are expensive to begin wedding with. Wedding dresses are just in general expensive as hell. Although I feel like if you're IFB, you probably know how to sew. You could probably sew your own wedding dress. Lots or, you of people. Know, that's yeah. where I'm getting to. Yeah. Lots of people sew their own. Uh, lots of people buy an off the rack wedding dress and alter it to make it fit their modesty ideas. So they'll buy, you know, like the ones that have like sheer panels on the sides or sheer a sheer back or sheer sleeves like lace sleeves but no material under the lace oh absolutely so they'll add the material under they'll just it. buy those and add the material huh so people will customize their own wedding dresses and then they will sometimes pass them down to other people 
So if you have like a super amazing custom one and then somebody, your best friend gets married a year later, you might let her wear it. Take it to um, a tailor, get that fixed, make it. Yeah. I mean, like, there's IFB tailors. Look dynamite. There yeah. are. Oh yeah. There is a, there's a woman at First Baptist Church of Hammond and everybody from First Baptist Church who is listening to this knows exactly who I'm talking about. Um, she was no, she for many, many years had a, a booming business making dresses for IFB brides and tailoring dresses for IFB brides. Okay. But that's for women. None of the men have ever been to a tailor in their <laughs> right. lives. No, she made my, she made my friend's wedding, close, close friend of mine's wedding dress. And it was a beautiful, it had a cape. Well, that's very nice. Great. It was pretty great. Yeah. So, but chapter 22, chapter 22 is 30 something and still single. Which is like, it's the shortest chapter. It's a page and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a little you bit just two like. two years, bro. Yeah. It says, uh, oh, God. I, I looked at this and I felt extremely called out by it because I am 28, <laughs> still very single, ladies. <laughs> leaving says, you podcast at gmail.com. Leaving you. Oh, God. Yeah. If you want to be my Beshert, uh, if, if you, uh, then, yeah. <laughs> So it says, be sure that jealousy and envy toward your married and engaged <laughs> friends does not find a lodging place in your <laughs> Oh, my God. Are you jealous and envious of me because I'm married? Not really. No. You got married way younger than I would have wanted to. That's true. Yeah. Fine. That's two. True. Also, I'm a man. I can get married literally like number two is so is find a godly counselor who is willing to involve himself or herself in the search for a right man told you so, yeah so is that you sadie are you going to be my godly counselor to involve oh, yourself are in... you asking me live on air to be your dating counselor so here's the thing is that it says 30 something is still single it assumes so it says find a godly counselor who is willing to involve himself or herself in your search for the right man it's assuming that if you are 30 something and still single you are a woman <laughs> it's a like, woman yeah you're right yeah. you know what i would be honored to be your dating counselor Okay. Oh, I will find you the right. I will find you the right woman. Number three, realize that as you get older, your tastes become more defined, and you may find very few men acceptable. Which is funny because I think of some of the people that I dated when I was younger, and I think about, oh God, what was I thinking? And <laughs> so you don't feel like you're getting less picky with age. No, I feel like I know what I want now. Yeah. That's the thing is that you get older, you know what you want. That or you just know what bullshit you won't put up with. Number four, look for a man with solid character, but who is unpolished. Okay. See, here's oh. the thing is that it's just saying you're over 30. You got to lower your standards a little bit. You got to be okay with a guy who's going to lick his plate at a formal restaurant. A stable man with grimy fingernails and frayed clothing. Uh but who possesses a balanced checkbook and a steady job might shine up with the right woman polishing him. Again, don't that... look. Okay, that's <laughs> not wrong. That's yeah, not but the like... word, the, the use of the word "polished" by Scop is just not, yeah, acceptable to me any longer. But other than that, mechanics make good money. That's true. They do have very dirty fingernails too. They're like, find a man that you can cheese all that. That's what yep. they're telling you. And if you are well into your adult singleness, I recommend that you choose the single life. Do not waste waste years of your health and strength with anger and resentment. Choose the life you've been handed and use it. Invest your life in others. And if it is God's will, he is more than able to bring across your path the man who needs the talents and skills that you have developed. So it's still assuming... That that is that this is speaking about a woman. Yes, they're like if over thirty men who are not married. They don't exist. Do they not exist in the IFB? If you're over thirty and you're a man, like, are you like automatically married? Now that I think about it, I've never known a man over thirty in the IFB who wasn't married. Wow, I've known a couple, but they got married. Chapter twenty four. This is so. This is the very end of the book, and we're like at almost the end of this episode because this episode has just been me going through this book and just like ridiculing it. We've gone for like two hours. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I've been holding Chuck the entire time. Chapter twenty four. Yeah, ooh, for the podcast for all of our fans. Yeah, we you, love you. So the whole much. podcast is who I was talking. Do you think I do this for you? No, I'm talking I thought you were fans. saying that you, I, you look. <laughs> You're going to find me a wife, but you won't 
stay on the podcast two hours for me. That no, seems for the fans. deeply inconsistent, but okay. You're not my fan. Are you my fan? Are you telling me you're a fan of me? I am a fan of you. I think you have a great Aww, story. Thanks. Um, Thank you. Okay, never mind. It's if, I, you, if I wasn't a fan of you, I wouldn't have, have done this show with you. Okay, it's for Why? all my fans, so I guess you're included. But chapter 24 is this poem that Jack Scopp wrote, I guess. I don't know. Did he? It says, if I could be your parent. Oh, right. Name. Did you ever, did you read this? Oh, I, just, I know I did. I don't remember what it said. This is like cringe-tastic right here. So here is the poem. It goes, and okay, also this, in this page, it is formatted very strangely in that. The whole I, book is formatted really badly, isn't it? Yeah. So what it says is, so there's like two stanzas so so it's like a poem but rather than using like like it'll have two stanzas next to each other so you don't know if you're supposed to go across and then or and then down or then like down like that column and then across the next column i'm gonna just go down but like the first line of this poem is if i could be your parent teen i'd never see divorce a suit a suitable solution marriage off its course divorce has never solved the false that lie in human hearts a marriage must be built by god or die from satan's darts this is a terrible poem because somebody's a fucking pedophile yeah you you're divorced jack scop because you raped a 17 year old girl and then transported her across state lines and did it again and then you did that also again, and then you got arrested for it, and then you went to prison, and you pretended that it was because you had ulcerative colitis or some shit like that, or prostate something. And Vague prostate problems. Yeah, you're like, I have prostate problems. It couldn't have been me, or I, I wasn't responsible for it, because you can never take responsibility for anything that you do, because you've never been held responsible for anything that you've ever done in your life. But you did walk around calling yourself doctor and write this terrible fucking book. Which I guess is like you look at him on the back. There's a picture of him on the back. It looks like if somebody put John Ham in the microwave a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in this picture, he doesn't look bad. He just looks like kind of greasy. Like you can see like the sweat reflecting on his forehead. Is he sweating in this picture? He's wearing a brown suit, too. Which so that he has is, very pink that scent. is a Hiles. I will tell you what's going on in that picture. I am pretty sure that is a Hiles Anderson College staff headshot. They do school portraits in the basement of the building, and they do them every September when you first come. Yeah, to he's school. got the Life Touch background, like for yes. the school picture and it day. It is hot as hell in the basement of Hiles Anderson College. It is very, very, very hot. He's sometimes just sweating. Sometimes it is still summer temperatures in September in Indiana, and it is so, 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 so hot in the room. The closed room with no windows where they take the school pictures, and I can almost guarantee you that is what happened. Yikes. This guy, he's he's a scumbag. We all know he's a scumbag. He's probably been polishing his shaft earlier that day, uh, <laughs> thinking about underage girls because that's what he does. He's He, he wrote this fucking teen dating manual when he was a grown-ass man, which is some weird shit for anybody to do. Yeah, I mean, so I mentioned at the very top of this episode about I Kiss Dating Goodbye by Josh Harris. He was like 21 when he wrote that book. So that's not that weird. Which seems a lot more appropriate. Now, most just about everything he said in that book was wrong. Bless his heart. And he's come out and said as much and renounced the whole thing. And I mean, But it's not it's not inappropriate. It's just wrong. But it's not. Yeah, it's not creepy and weird. Like this dating with a porpoise is just just a cringe fest. So, and so just so creepy. And uh, I promise next time I pick reverse homework, I'll do something less just creepy. No, I found this book hilarious. Oh, good. Okay. It's. I thought it was ridiculous. I'm just glad I didn't have to actually read it again because I did remember enough. This book is it's so funny. There's just so, like, because it seems like what it will be is, you know, every chapter will have this formula where he will come out with some point where he'll just be like, it's good to do this and it's bad to do this. One time I knew a young man in college and he thought this thing and I told him he was wrong. And what do you know it? I was right. And then like he'll tell some story where there is like incredible poetic justice and it's all like the type of shit that you think probably ended up on, you know, the subreddit R that happened. 
where it's just like this conversation definitely never occurred in real life, Jack Scop. So all of these people were like Paul Sands, like kids and nieces and nephews. Yes, the the Sand family is. Uh, <laughs> the Sand family is alive and well. Well, they are they are numerous as the grains of sand. Uh, oh, as nice. Yeah, made made a Bible reference there. Uh, do we have anything else that we want to talk about? I am literally so done talking. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for listening but this to has this. Been, but this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to this absolutely ridiculous homework episode of the Leaving Eden podcast. And if you've made it this far, we really appreciate you making it this far into this episode <laughs> that we've been talking for a very long time. Uh, the uh, If you like this show, you can join our Patreon where you can hear an even longer version of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> And for the month of June, all of the money that goes into our Patreon as well as our merch sales uh, will be going to the Howard Brown Health Center in Chicago, where they provide medical care for the LGBTQ community because we are doing all queer focused content in the month of June. So if you are a queer person, you were raised in the IFB or a similar cult like group had a similar repressive upbringing. Please send us your stories if you want us to read them on the air. Make sure if you do, you include your correct pronouns. You include your name and whether or not we are allowed to use your real name on air or whether or not you want us to call you something else. Uh, Anything else that you want to say? No, that's about it. We've gotten some really amazing stories and I am excited for June and also maybe for some more uplifting content after the the middle of may the way that that all went <laughs> yikes yeah Jeez, louise yikes. all right well we're we're excited for for june and what's coming up next yes yes That's yes yes, yes. I wanted to say. uh and you can follow the leaving eden podcast on facebook instagram uh at leaving eden podcast on twitter it is at leaving eden pod sadie do you want to plug your social media Yep, you can follow me on Twitter at Hell yes Sadie or on Instagram at Sadie Carpenter Music. Also on TikTok at Sadie Carpenter One and also at Leaving Eden po- Leaving Eden Podcast on TikTok. Yes, and you can follow me. I can't use TikTok. <laughs> hmm. I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't pay attention. It's Do fine. I don't get Twitter. You don't get TikTok. Between the two of us, we're cool. Somebody sent a somebody sent us a, a, a meme today where it was that Dave Hiles is on TikTok and I was just like Dave Hiles better not be on fucking TikTok. Oh, Jesus he probably Christ. has a creeper account. Yeah, because what he's I mean TikTok is full of teenagers. So yeah. I ugh. imagine he has one. Yikes! No, thank you. Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse at G A V R I E L H A C O H E N. Uh, and until what are we talking about on Tuesday? We're talking about the trail of blood. Yeah, Tuesday or we're Monday. finally getting along to around to it. Monday, I should say, not Tuesday. Yeah, we're talking right. about something called trail of blood. I don't know what that is. Sadie's going to tell me what that is uh, on that day. It's something to do with Baptist and Jesus. Uh, please join us then when we do. Uh, and until then, uh, we hope that you have a very nice day. Bye bye. Yeah.